How would a diabetic determine which protein powder is the very best one to use? If you think your supplement is purely protein, then you're grossly misinformed. How can you tell by just reading the package if the brand you're using is pure and clear of all contaminants? Today, you will learn the dirty little hidden secrets the supplement industry does not want you to know. From what is known as protein spiking to using inferior powders so that they can reap maximum profits but at the expense of your health and wallet. Protein powders. Are these the holy grail of supplements, especially for us diabetics? The global protein supplement market is anticipated to be the size of 32.6 billion by 2027. So to say that protein powders are popular is an understatement. Furthermore, they claim to do it all, from building muscle, to helping you lose body fat, to leveraging muscle recovery after a grueling workout. With so many diabetics now wanting to include protein powders in their diets, first, we must address what are the dangers of consuming protein powders every single day, and how do they affect our blood sugars in particular? Second, how can we tell which powders are the best for us diabetics, and I will share a behind the scenes secret the supplement industry definitely do not want you to know. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that gray notification bell for me. That way, you'll be alerted when new life changing episodes have been published. And if you learned something new today, please smash that like button for me. If you or someone you know, whether they're diabetic or not, and they take protein supplements, then please share this episode with them. What you will learn today will not only change how you choose which ones to buy so that you don't get ripped off, but I'll also show you how I personally leverage these powders so that it helps me maintain an A1C in the low fives and helps me maintain a body composition just like this, even as an insulin dependent type one diabetic. Let me begin by telling you a very well known behind the scenes secret in the upper echelon of bodybuilding. And how do I know? I've worked with and consulted many top players in the field. I know firsthand what it takes to not only stand on the Mr. Olympia stage, but to win it. And I'll ask you this very important question. Do you believe these bodybuilders created their world-class physiques with the use of supplements? To answer that question, you have to first understand how do these athletes pay their bills? It is the contracts they endorse, the supplements they promote, the clothing line they may wear to even the gym equipment they will use. If you had access to the real diets of many of these elite athletes, as I do, you would notice they actually do not take the vast majority of supplements they endorse. Surprise, surprise. They simply rely on a good whey protein isolate. But here is the key. It's limited to certain times of the day, as I will explain. To really create a world-class body, the focus is on structured meals eaten on the clock, spaced out throughout the day. And some, during what's known as the off-season growth period, will actually wake up in the middle of the night to even eat another protein-rich meal. All of the meals are based on high-quality real protein foods, eggs, chicken, beef, fish, turkey, the industry wants you to believe the greatest bodies on this planet were built solely on their supplements. And unfortunately, that can't be further from the truth. But in the real world, there will be days where it's just too hard to hit your daily protein goals, especially right after one has exercised. 
And this is when having a good protein powder in hand can really help. However, unbeknownst to you, some protein powders out there may be doing you more harm than good. If you want your protein powder to stop holding you back from reaching your goals, then continue watching and learn what to look for and what to avoid. Finding the right protein powder can be difficult, especially with all the different options that we have. There are so many types from whey protein, casein protein, hemp protein, rice protein, even soy protein. The list is endless. The first thing you should know, your protein powder should be mostly protein. Sounds kind of basic, but you'd be surprised by how many protein powders are less than 75% protein. That means for every three scoops of actual protein, one scoop is chemicals, fillers, carbs, and fats. To first identify the quality of your protein, let's look at how we can find the ratio of protein to filler in the protein powders you want to compare. And the simple equation is this. You can slow it down, pause, and write this down. You want to divide the grams of protein per serving by the total serving size, then multiply it by 100. That gives you a percentage of the protein in the serving or in each scoop. The higher the percentage, the higher the quality and the fewer the fillers that are present in your supplements. Let's walk through a few examples. Say you've got protein A and the whole container has a 50 gram serving and 22 grams of protein per serving. So we would divide 22 by 50, multiply that by 100 and that would give us 44%. In comparison to protein B, say it has a 31 gram serving size with 24 grams of protein per serving. That will give you 77%. And at first glance, those examples would look almost identical in their value. But we would find protein B has more protein and less filler than protein A. And that is a significant amount. Now, there may also be a trade-off. I would bet protein A probably tastes a little better and mixes a little better, but you're spending your money on the stuff that makes up the taste rather than the protein. Now you know what to look for. It's time to learn about what to avoid. When it comes to ingredients, more is not better. This is why you should be very careful with any protein that has far too many ingredients on the list. Vegan protein powders, which I do not recommend at all, seem to be the main problem here. If you are vegan, pay special attention to soy and pea proteins. Those two in particular contain a dozen of other ingredients just to give it the taste and texture that is similar to regular protein. Protein powders are classified as a dietary supplement, and I've covered this before, but it's important to understand. So it's not regulated by the Food and Drug Administration the same way our conventional food or medicines are. Supplements do not need FDA approval before they hit the market. This means it's up to that manufacturer to make sure their products are safe and accurately marketed. That means there is no requirement that the protein powders be tested to make sure they contain what the labels say they contain. You are at their complete mercy. Certain protein powders have been found to contain heavy metals in higher levels than what is recommended. The biggest danger with consuming protein powders, especially the cheap nameless brands, are the potential contaminants of the supplements. Different protein powders from different manufacturers are like snowflakes. No two are alike. That makes their effectiveness very difficult to study because nutrients don't work in a vacuum. Different combinations affect your body differently. Those special mixtures of certain amino acids, fillers, artificial sugars, artificial flavors could have varying dosages and results especially on your blood sugars. Sometimes 
Certain aggressive brands have proprietary blends that are also frequently spiked with caffeine, sugars, steroids, and other ingredients that haven't been tested at all. Now, we can get into the real dark side of the supplement industry where manipulation of the formulas come in. Very, very few of these supplement companies get into business to specifically improve your health. They get into business to make money and lots of it off your ignorance. And how is that done? The first way is through a process called protein powder spiking. Supplement manufacturers sometimes dump cheap ingredients into their powders to pass tests to claim a higher protein content than what it truly has so that they can, what, boost their profits. How does amino spiking or protein spiking work? Some labs, they will test for the nitrogen content of the protein powder rather than the amounts of the individual amino acids, the building blocks of protein. So we do have to talk a little chemistry here for you to understand. Every amino acid contains a nitrogen. The first way they cheat the system is to dump the cheapest of amino acids like glycine and taurine into the mix, which do basically nothing for your muscles. Amino acids are not all of equal value. Complete proteins are the most valuable and they are also the most expensive to add to supplements. These are the ones that are critical to the repair and the muscle building process. The second way to cheat the system is to add other non-protein nitrogen-based ingredients into the mix, such as creatine and beta alanine. How bad is this practice? There was an alleged class action lawsuit filed against Body Fortress. This is the most popular protein brand found at Walmart and for reportedly spiking their protein products. If they're doing this, then it shows how prevalent it may be. Let's move on to other protein scams that are used. And this is probably one of the most common tricks that some of the makers of protein powders will use. Whey protein concentrate, by definition, can be anywhere from 25% to 89% pure protein. A lot of companies will use the inferior form of whey protein concentrate. You want to make absolutely sure that on the label, it says that this whey protein concentrate is at least 80% protein. If it does not say that on the label, you're more than likely getting ripped off and they're using an inferior form. What are the other additional red flags to look out for when shopping for a good brand? First, look out for the word like proprietary blends. Proprietary blends are just another way for manufacturers to hide the quality of the ingredients in the mix. Second, does it list the leucine content? And we've talked about the importance of leucine already as it stimulates muscle protein synthesis. Around 11% of the whey protein content should be leucine. So we should see around 2.7 grams per 25 grams of protein. Third, the cost. The average retail price for a high quality protein is around 12 to 15 bucks per pound. If it's cheaper than average, then you know they've cut corners somewhere. You pay for what you get in this industry. If you pick up a bottle, turn it around, you should never ever see creatine, glycine, and taurine in the other ingredient section on that protein model. Look for brands that are what's known as Good Manufacturing Process Certified or GMP. It does help to have peace of mind that the product that has been manufactured is in a GMP certified facility since the supplement industry is unregulated. GMP will either be on the container or the company will provide you with a letter from the manufacturer stating the product is certified. What we as diabetics are also specifically concerned about is how different products affect our blood sugars. 
It all again depends on how many grams of carbs are in the serving. And I've specifically mentioned this already, look for the ones that have three grams or less. It also depends on how they sweeten the powder and which artificial sweetener or sugar alcohol they may use. Many of you may notice, regardless of the brand and how many carbs are in the mix, you will see a rise in blood sugars. And what you may not know, healthy non-diabetics will also see an elevation in blood insulin at the same time. Even I, as a type 1 diabetic, may need to take a little bit of insulin to cover the rise in sugars after a drink. And it all depends on which manufacturer. We've been conditioned to believe insulin is always a bad thing. And it is if one has chronically elevated levels all day long. But in order to get those amino acids or protein into the muscle tissue for repair and recovery, insulin is needed. Yes, insulin is that master hormone that stores fat in fat cells and locks them there. But it is also responsible for moving nutrients in the muscle tissue too. And without it, you cannot store glucose or sugars or protein in that muscle tissue, let alone build or repair damaged muscles. This is why keeping or building muscle is so critical to the health of us diabetics. It is that muscle that is responsible for removing all those blood sugars after a meal. Let's get to the million dollar question. When would one want to take a very good whey protein isolate supplement? If your goal is to gain muscle or to lose fat, stimulating insulin after a workout is actually the ideal. The reason, as explained, Insulin is also anti-catabolic, which means it stops the muscle breakdown after a workout, especially intensive weight training. Not only does this present a better environment for muscle growth, but it also ensures you do not lose muscle while dieting. And that is exactly what I personally do. I will leverage a scoop of around 25 grams of whey protein isolate post-workout to stop the muscle breakdown process and help leverage, repair, and recovery. And then, listen to me carefully here, I will have another real food-based meal high in protein about an hour later. There is no reason for me personally to be taking protein subs at any other time of the day or on days I don't train. My main dietary focus is getting all of my protein from real animal-based sources. And as diabetics, you are going to have to test different brands with your glucose meters. Some brands will spike you more than others regardless of what's on the label. I personally know the owner of a GNC near one of my gyms and I've personally asked him to save me all of his expired bottles, the ones that haven't sold, and even the ones returned by his customers. He saves them for me, and I get to test them before he throws them away. And I will tell you firsthand, they are all like snowflakes. Each one affects me differently. Some, even with what's listed on the ingredients, will spike me worse than a can of soda. And that is not what we want. Ask the manager or the owner of the supplement store near you for samples and even return or old products for you to test. And believe me, even if you do the homework as explained and try to find the best ones, it will be your glucose meter in the end that will verify your top brands. Maintaining and keeping your muscle tissue is the single most important task we as diabetics have towards normalizing and controlling our blood sugars, which leads to living that long, independent life free of complications. But I bet many of you have many additional questions like, what role does protein play once one becomes a diabetic? Does excessive protein cause kidney damage? And how does it affect 
blood sugars. How much protein does a diabetic need per day? I'll set up a playlist for you with all the answers to these questions and I will even expose more deceits and misunderstandings doctors and nutritionists are still taught to this very day about protein. If you're on your cell desktop or laptop, I want you to click these upcoming boxes. The first is the link to subscribe to this all-important life-changing channel. The second is the link to the playlist on proteins. So have a great and productive day, and we will see you soon with another new episode, which are generally released weekly. Bye for now.